Hello and welcome to Podcastle in the Sky. We're going to do intros of ourselves first this time, if that's okay. So I'm Dylan. I'm Amber. I am Jesse. I'm Tom. And I'm William. And on today's episode, we'll be tackling the topic of Eastern and Western takes on superpowers, with two works both released in uh, in 2012 in America. One is the film Chronicle, directed by Josh Trank and written by Trank and Max Landis, a non-licensed sort of toned-down take on superhero stories, comic book stories. And conversely, we have the 12-episode anime series Paula Magai Madoka Magica, written by Gen Urobuchi and directed by Akiyuki Shimbo, for the notoriously off-kilter animation studio Shaft, which takes on the conventions of the Maho Shoujo or Magical Girl genre. Take it away. What? Oh, yeah, me! <laughs> Sorry. Go for it. <laughs> I, I, uh, anyway, uh, okay, I would like to just first word, uh, I really like that both series address the idea of people of this age getting magic powers. Like, both... Uh, Madoka and Chronicle, and I'm thinking Chronicle especially because I just watched it and it's on my mind, have these moments where the kids revel in their power, in their new found power. Before things get, you know, touchy and wrong, they just love the idea of having power and the things they can do with the power. Of course, in Chronicle, they more, you know, fuck around with it than uh, in Madoka because they also have a mission. But uh, I just, I, I, I felt it was very real. Uh, both, both shows, both the show and the movie are very real with the idea of what happens with, um, a child of a certain age when they gain just incredible power. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the extrapolating danger from that ultimately. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they both obviously play around with, I mean, the foundations basically of both genres on some level is wouldn't it be awesome if and i mean basically the answer in both programs is kind of but mostly not really so (laughs) so actually it'd be horrible and uh, it's more horrible in in medica for a a variety of reasons and chronicle it's uh, oh on that on that note i'm gonna say this right now i was mean to say this earlier but i uh we've already established our spoiler policy in previous episodes but i want to be very clear with this one especially like there's no proper way to talk about either of these works without really getting into certain plot details so if you haven't seen either of these things i'd really recommend watching them before you listen to this episode like this just goes especially for this episode yes oh, but yeah. we we will try to avoid uh discussing spoilers of other subjects yeah. so if you're listening to this yeah. and you haven't seen Captain America Civil War. We will not be going into the uh, surprising reveal that uh, Spider-Man was... I had something for this. Well, <laughs> well man. <laughs> Dumbledore dies. Oh. Uh, the yeah, Dumbledore yeah. Sinks, uh, the Nazis okay. lose World War II. I think we got them all. Okay, guys. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah. that element is good, and I think Madoka very explicitly links in the sort of emotional uh, turmoil of that age into the plot, which I think yeah. is yeah. an interesting choice. And to a lesser extent, Chronicle does the same with the the antagonist slash protagonist on some level, because it's the way the found footage element works. He's the cameraman uh, for some of the movie, and but he's also the, the villain, uh, this Andrew character. And obviously his sort of angst is kind of the centerpiece of what makes everything go wrong from start to back. Yeah, the... Yeah, the well, I don't know really if it... I wouldn't even book. really call him the antagonist, though. I would say that the power is the antagonist more than anything. Mm-hmm. No, he's... Like, he's got, he's given him himself the villain. a super villain name by the end of the movie. I, yeah. Well, I would call I mean, him the villain. I mean, I whether call, or not he's the antagonist, he fills the role of the villain I would in, the, in the kind of comic book ethos of the story. Yeah, yeah. I would say he becomes a villain, yeah. but I wouldn't call him the antagonist. I feel mm. that the antagonist was this ultimate power that these kids were given, and because of who they are, particularly Andrew and his issues, uh, you know, he becomes a villain uh, as fair. a result. Just as the, the girl in... Uh, Madoka Magica. I'm sorry, I, I can't remember their names, but uh, the time the time turner girl. Homer Akemi. Yeah, Homura. she's not she's not ever a vi- she's not a villain like Andrew ever no. was, but she she is somewhat. Homer is arguably the protagonist. Yeah, yeah, she's she's but she she's very much 
Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end, you discover that she's been the protagonist all along, you know, like. But Madoka takes the role of protagonist. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, it's very nuanced in Madoka where, yeah. like, pretty much it, um, every, every main character has the role of antagonist at some point, like, in terms of plot structure, but none of them are ultimately the antagonist. No, no, no. This is also kind of a, a flip, I think, for both well, really. because. They both um, have an expectation that uh, Madoka and Andrew are going to be the protagonist, probably the straight-up hero, and then they undermine that as they go on. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and well, Madoka, it's like um, she's a bystander in the like episode twelve. At the end. Yep. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Madoka, it's that is it's that she's a passive character, and in yeah, in Chronicle, it's a he's super villain. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's it's seen. Because, I mean, the thing with Madoka is, you know, there's there's this looming event, this Walpurgis Night event that's going to destroy the city and everything, but that's sort of an abstract enemy at some level. Mm-hmm. Like, arguably, the true antagonist-antagonist is Kubei, but even, mm-hmm. yeah, but even, even he is in a sort of... There's a lot of ambivalence on the degree to which he is actually evil, evil versus just unknowable. And even at the end, like, there's not a big, at least as far as the show is concerned, there's not, like, a showdown with Kubei where everything is completely corrected. There's, the world is partially fixed by what Madoka does, but there's still yeah. a lot of problems in it. The it's not like of Madoka Magica is about, is about making alterations to a larger system rather than just, yeah, like, between yeah. individuals. But it's, it's not that's... an ultimate victory. There's a Which big is loss. Which even Kubei isn't truly the villain of the story because he's just operating, right. operating on his particular per- per- perspective and philosophy and within his system's goals. And it's, right. it's I, the I real think... problem. It's the system is the problem, which is a great... The system is the problem, I, yeah. I feel like uh, Kubei, however, has known the sophistry to him. He's very good at arguing his point, mm-hmm. but his point isn't as good as he thinks it is. Like I, I think of like one element in the time travel cycle after Madoka has been killed and while well, Purgus knocked is about to destroy the world, Kubei shrugs and thinks, well, this is humanity's problem. This really isn't our affair. The yeah. sequence of events which his species has created is not their problem. Right. There's this complete, like, he keeps maintaining almost to himself that there's a fairness in how they're dealing with people, but it's fundamentally manipulative and amoral, and ultimately completely apathetic to any kind of human concerns. Like, he talks about the idea, wouldn't humans, you know, want a galaxy that isn't falling apart? But that's just another one of the, his rhetorical cards in the deck. I think Kubey is very good at arguing his point. I don't think he has a lot of convictions in it. Ultimately. Well, what I, what I really like, like he about He ultimately the just argument... wants the power, and he's very good at finding a way to get it. Well, the way th- the great thing about that argument, too, is, uh, I mean, by the end, you also realize that he and his entire species expect that humanity will die from their actions. But they're one blip in the universe, you know, so hmm. they're essentially asking hum- humans, uh, they're taking these tiny girls uh, without telling them the entirety of what they're giving up. Um and and forcing them to choose to destroy humanity for their you know for their own fight against entropy you know and i find that interesting what i thought interesting was the whole contract thing essentially the way it operates is a faustian bargain that um, mm-hmm. this supernatural entity offers their heart's desire in return for like something in, for, in return for them sacrificing something of their own and the way it works is almost classically the way the whole Faustian bargain works, that they end up regretting what they wish for, and it all comes crashing down to the end. Yeah, it's using mm-hmm. a very different archetypal concept to riff, um, to, uh, to riff on a convention of the magical girl genre, which is that is that the characters get their powers from an unexplained magical what's it. Yeah, I mean, the whole contract thing, usually you get a copy of the contract, it's a regular non-magical contract. <laughs> you get a copy, and you can have, read it over. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, <laughs> they, they keep stuff from well, you. Yeah, Kubei's contracts aren't like, especially well, like Mommy's. Mommy's case is the most pure example of that's pure coercion. 
But... Right, she's about to die. Yeah, she she's is. Mm-hmm. You can keep living if you make this contract with me. Yeah, right, no, he's very, right. very clearly preys on the vulnerable. Yeah. And so there is that, like uh, William was saying, there's a question of the degree to which the amount he's saying, well, it's just logical for us. There, there's an element there where it's, does he really not realize what he's doing, or is he just yeah. uh, oh, yeah. saying, it's, it's saying a- that to, to, to wash his hands of responsibility for all the horrible right. things he's doing to other people? He's uh, in many ways a very like, easily angry and frustrating character, but but I do, I mean, I guess Dirk maybe feels a little differently about this, but I, pre- I do pretty much buy into his, his sincerity of perspective. The comparison I would make to get to go into what I think are one of the influences on what Chronicle is doing is I sort of see Cube as sort of as looking at the world the same way that Dr. Manhattan does in Watchmen. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty, on some level, I, I it's mean, a like, common sci-fi but, conceit, like the, the, the master sort yeah, of yeah, universal. Is, is, like, race. he's just completely alien. He just genuinely doesn't understand human, humanity and its concerns. He doesn't get why they care about where their souls are to, to quote Yeah. It. And I mean, yeah. the thing with Cube is like, like the alien entity that has, that has fostered Earth and then comes to, to sort of, you know, reap its fields. Uh, that's pretty common in sci-fi, but usually it's distinctly sort of selfish. It's like, oh, we've been preparing humans and now we're going to eat them all. They're our food source. <laughs> yes. Whereas exactly. here, the end, goal, the end goal is supposedly sort of has a, uh, a broader altruism to it in some sort of structural way. Whereas usually it's just like, ah, they're aliens and they want to eat the humans. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas here it's yep. a little, but the, the conceit unto itself is is pretty common in sci-fi. Yeah, but I think there are like there are little distinctions. Like um, at one moment, Cube says, "Okay, if you're not interested, I'll just go find some other girls." That's blatantly a ploy of, you know, I'm not pressing you too hard. The moment one of Sayaka or Madaka begins to think they're changing their mind, boom, he's out the window. Yeah. Right. You know, there's, yeah. A, there's an ele- there's an understanding of human psychology in Cube, which I don't think really tracks with his explanations of his own ignorance of it. And another thing I'd point would be yeah. the soul gem. But let's accept that he doesn't understand why the soul gem upsets humans. As he later tells us, his species has been doing this since humans were in caves. Right. He would have seen people upset before. Even if he doesn't understand it, he would be aware it exists. Well, yeah, but he doesn't And he care. doesn't care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, right. At yeah, best. He at best. He, so I, I think he, I think he always, he, uh, there's a lot of truth to what he says, because the easiest way to lie is to say a lot of the truth. But yeah. ultimately, he's okay with lying a little to you, because as he's already told you, you're like livestock to him, he doesn't really care. Yeah. Right. yeah, he well, he clearly does. I mean, he clearly must know how humans work, work because yeah. I, I feel like, uh, I mean, his whole approach towards the girls at first is with that really mm. excited voice and the, oh, look at the things you could do and look at how you can help and you know what I mean? Like, it's not until later that he, when he's already got the girls, when they've already signed their contract and, you know, they are doomed, that he gets cold. So he, he he must know what he's doing. He can't be doing this. You well, know what I mean? Obviously, you know he withholds the you know he withholds the information for a reason. He could say it's because well, you didn't ask, but, but he knows but it's, it's because not, they would react negatively. Well, but it's not even just the withholding of information. It's the 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 lure. You know, he's luring them. Right, clearly, there's an element of clearly, contempt to him. Yeah, like like so I don't know like like. Well, like Will said, he ha- he has to know on some level that what he's doing is wrong, but uh, still does it. And and I guess what do you call it? The word that means you do it anyway, even though you feel it's wrong. <laughs> I think it's a. Uh, I think he compartmentalizes, and he has very different. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's always about yeah. the the bigger picture. I mean, it reminds me yeah. a little. Of- I mean, the whole series really reminds me a lot of Bocarano. In fact, when I watched it, that was all the way through, because Bocarano is a very similar mecha anime. It's another cute creature which gets a bunch of kids and convinces them to pilot a giant robot, and the result is they all start dying because of it. In fact, they inevitably die. After every battle, one of them dies. 
And it's, it's even a big surprise in the first episode where the charismatic boy, who's clearly the protagonist, boom, dead. So structurally similar. But the reveal is also similar because the robots are fighting other robots from other universes. And whoever wins, that universe gets to continue to exist. So they're not fighting bad people. They're fighting people who are, you know, just as motivated as they are. Well, So there's I mean, a certain element of, of, of cosmic reasoning for this horrible thing to happen. I mean, it's being that, motivated that, and going forward. That's relevant to the thematic ideas of like the actual nature of the witches. See that whole um this whole thing about like cosmic powers and parallel universes and like all this flash drama thing, uh dark and something. Uh, the entire time I was watching Madoka, I was uh, I was thinking it was very much like a, a superhero comic book. And if I'd known it was so much like this I would have suggested an actual comic book first. Like uh, this the climax with the um Universes colliding together and like a, oh, what the, what the hell, a giant cosmic boulder dash. It, oh, it, it, it was, uh, it was like a, it's like a, the end of like a classic comic book crossover, like, yeah. like some different, different or something. All our multiverses yeah, are smashed yeah. together. Yeah, Monkey exactly Hulk is like fighting, uh, Civil War Hulk. Exactly, <laughs> like, it was all like that. Hulk. Hulk was on another planet during Civil War. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot there really was a planet Hulk, wasn't there? Yes. Yeah, he was. What is it? Uh, he was basically doing gladiators. Well, that right. sounds fantastic. Everything about this. It <laughs> it's it's really sorry. Let's not get too off topic here. But... Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, no, it's a good point. I mean, I've never read comics like that, but watching the end, I was thinking of you know, because I was thinking of superheroes because of this podcast. It did occur to me like the kind of weird wonky space thing. It's like. Oh yeah, that's probably the kind of you know crap Kirby would throw into something, right? The whole kind yeah. of everything's ending, so let's have a big you know shot of space to show how enormous the stakes are, that kind of thing. There's a giant or am I just off base? Yeah, coming out of the city, that's, it's that's, gonna that's destroy really everything. Fits. Yeah, that really fits. That makes when, that, makes, yeah. that makes sense to me as someone who reads a lot about comic biz and that engage with the actual. I mean, story really, the two genres are kind of similar in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, magical I mean, power. You just. To put context, I've only read one Silver Surfer comic, and it was the Mobius one. So right. that's my knowledge. Well, you know, there. it's like costumes, powers, and, and, um, you know, sometimes young people with powers. Young people with powers and friendship. Friendship. Okay. <laughs> Giant glowing beams about to destroy things. It's all there. Yeah, we we <laughs> set a pretty effective genre parallel here. <laughs> and each one has a different kind of power. Yes. You know, like the superhero. Mm-hmm. And so when working as a team, they have to figure out how to apply their different powers differently. Yeah. yeah. That's basically, yeah. like, um, the way the Magic Girl genre is, uh, uh, diff- like, um, a female version of the, um, Super Sentai TV show, where the, yeah. the oh, Power yeah. Rangers and so on, where they all yeah. have different weapons and different colors, and they all come together to fight the bad guys. An awesome changing scene! Yes. Oh, yeah, transformation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Powers yeah. bouncing. Yeah each other, all sorts of stuff. Well, those I mean, are essential, and the series really uh, hinges on them. In fact, Madoka is probably unique in Magical Girl series in that perhaps its climax is a changing scene. Because yeah. changing scenes by definition, someone becoming the hero, that's the start of something to happening. With Madoka, it's the end. Yeah, because when Madoka becomes a magical girl, well, that is the solution to the show. Right. So because they structure the plot that way, they let the most iconic moment of a Magical Girl series, the transformation, become, you know, the apotheosis dramatically, which is a wonderful touch, I think. Well, actually, I would also like to point out that, okay, so this, the original universe they started on, and it's like the dark universe where girls become witches and so on. But Madoka, with the way she becomes a god, she basically changes the universe to become the normal Magical Girl universe, where Magical yeah. Girls have... Uh, Adventurous fighting evil, so. yeah. but they do still, but they do still die at a yeah. relatively young age, yeah. right? Like, yeah, their, that was their life. Old. Their life still suck, but their sacrifices matter more. Right. Oh, and they get to go to Magical Girl Heaven with Madoka. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Not yeah. A bad deal. It's all very relevant to the plot of Rebellion, which I think we'll get yeah. to some point. Uh, yeah, religious spirit aspect. Rebellion really pulls that up. <laughs> oh well, actually, now that I think about it, like in Sailor Moon in the first season, like they all sacrifice themselves. Yeah, they all die at the end of the 
They scene. all die at the end, yeah. Yeah. And they're all brought back like, to like time shenanigans or something. I forget exactly. Yeah. I can't quite remember. Time shenanigans and or I think maybe the love of Probably the power something. of friendship. Oh yeah, friendship, friendship <laughs> love. Yeah. <laughs> In the case Which, of Madoka, it, you have a series. This is exactly Madoka. what happened to Madoka. Yeah, yeah. every single yeah. main the power of love and friendship at, wins at some point in the series, and by the end, most of them do get to still be alive, except for Madoka, who removed herself from existence entirely, and Sayaka, who is like the trade-off where one person stays dead because stakes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's interesting, going back to uh, uh, what we were talking about a little bit earlier, because. You know, we, with, with Madoka, it's this, like, huge battle against cosmic forces, uh, that are beyond any of these individual characters sort of understanding at the beginning. And, I mean, Chronicle sort of flips things around in a different way, because with kind of where superhero movies are right now, generally speaking, the stakes just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, we have, Age of Ultron and the giant floating chair guy, uh, you know, he's going to eat the universe. And so when I do... Yeah, I mean, giant floating like, chair guy. Uh, Thor 2, <laughs> the dark world, where a random elf decides he wants to reset the entire universe because he preferred it when it was dark and there were no stars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or something. I, I think that's his plot, but I could I'm be wrong. Sure. I'm a doctor for a movie I barely remember. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. I just thought it was funny because technically, if you look at all the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies, the ones with the biggest stakes is Thor 2. It's the only one where the universe literally is being threatened to be wiped out. But it also feels like one of the more pointless films. It's yeah, like, you know, yeah. raising stakes isn't always the best thing. Yeah. Right, and that's what I appreciate about Chronicle. Uh, it's, you yeah. know, it's not a, it's an imperfect movie, but the stakes are very low mm-hmm. a, as these movies go. Like, it's, it's it tied completely to the characters, the fate of these yeah. small group of characters. Yeah, yeah. Chronicle is um, very much an origin movie. Yeah, it's very much... I, I, like, I like just comparing and contrasting. I like that... There are moments in Chronicle where the power of friendship could have saved the day, but fails, you know? Yeah, like, utterly fails. Yeah, utterly yeah. fails because Andrews just can't control himself. And boom, yeah. Well, I was just going to say what I think what works, too, is that because what you run into with sort of traditional superhero movie franchises, um, you know, you see the Sync movie. This is the big complaint with Spider-Man 3, for example. It's there's six expectation that you know we need to get in uh this villain we need to get in this villain or you know and so the the story has become really bloated and really weighed down in just lore and backstory and linking it to multiverses that many people don't care about um and so the stories get so heavy so i think what makes chronicle work despite its imperfections is the fact that you know, it's telling, it's it's taking the fun elements of a superhero movie, which is, wh- what would you do with these powers, and and getting rid of all the superfluous lore garbage, and just telling a story about these characters and the the, the antagonist slash villain, which is, in this case Andrew can develop organically out of what happens to these characters, what happens in the story, rather than oh we need we need the black suit Spider Man to do evil things now. Yeah. You know, there, there's no expectation yeah. about that's that. engaging with conventions rather than engaging with a source material directly. As it's a, not just checking off boxes, which helps. Yeah. But, um, which was one of the reasons I suggested specifically doing Chronicle. I'd never seen it, but I felt like if we were looking at something that was a direct adaptation of an existing property, it would be kind of odd comparing it to Madoka because, you know, Madoka is not. Right. Yeah. You know? Madoka yeah. is an original work of, yeah, that's a convergence of the ideas of Gen Rabucci and the directors, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is also exactly what happened here. Just like with uh, sure. Madoka, you have a, a very individualistic, opinionated director and screenwriter. You know. Both of whom have gone on to flawless careers. So the- <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. You know what? Um, I have a question about Madoka. Like, um, who the hell is the audience? Like, um, is there a is there a lot of people wanting to like uh, see magical girls getting the crap out of them? Like, uh, Madoka Magic is like a massive multi hundred million dollar franchise. In Japan. I know, but um, yeah, but, but, but no, no, no. that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, well, that's a valid before question. Before Madoka Magica was a massive hit, it was just the latest Shaft show. Like I remember seeing like a preview for that season of anime. 
There's like a ton of shows. And somewhere off in the corner, there's this really pink dress on a girl with pink hair with like pink bows. It's like Shaft, Madoka Magica. And I was like, okay, it doesn't look as like fun and dark as like uh, Goodbye Despair Teacher or Sayonara Zespo Sensei, if we must use the Japanese name. But I like Shaft, so I'm not going to ignore it. And someone else wrote, I'm definitely going to watch this because it's Shaft. And that was it. You know, it didn't look like it was going to be this amazing, massive, epoch-defining hit. I'm sure, like, the people who are familiar with Gen Urobuchi, because he did have a fandom prior to this, he'd written novels and visual novels, they probably had an idea that it might be pretty good, but I doubt even they expected it to be as popular as it was. And if they did, you know, well, great for you, you're really good at predicting trends. <laughs> but there is a related, but, uh, really great question was raised there, is who is it for? Like when they wrote it, when they produced it, who are they thinking of? Now, my understanding, I suppose I should Google this first, is that the series was a sign-in series, which means the intended argument was adult males, usually in their 20s. But uh, that's just in terms of branding. It's like one of four brands, like adult women, adult men, boys, girls, children. And I believe that was one they chose. Yeah, this, this is a whole thing. Jumping in yeah. here for a second. As the resident, apologies here, uh, as the resident young Tumblr user here. <laughs> Go ahead. Resident of that section of the population. Like, that like that aspect of the argument of was this, yeah, is, if this is classified as a sane and show, who was this show marketed towards, who is it aimed towards? That's a massive debate in feminist and social justice circles about, like, the qual, about the values and the quality of the show. Because of the idea of like, of like, that this is a work that's about women. There's an argument for it having engagement with, uh, themes of, of patriarchy and society, of its effects on women and all these things. And then there's the side of like, that this is, that this show is for men. This is about ex, this is basically expectation of women for men's enjoyment. My answer to this question is who cares? Just watch what you like and take what you want out of it. <laughs> well, that's my answer. <laughs> My answer is, I feel like it's a bit of a bait and switch in this regard. I yeah. mean, Shaft had done a lot yeah. of shows that are aimed at men with predominantly female characters. Right. And a couple of them are like straight Mo shows. But a couple What's, of others wait, are wait, wait, taking... Wait, 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 have... Could you explain? Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to find it. Okay. Yeah. Mo, or Moe, to pronounce it correctly, and not to pronounce it like it's the barman in The Simpsons, is a kind of cutesy, fetishized innocence marketed primarily at men. Series like Lucky Star mm -hmm. and Clannad and more recent examples I can't think of because I'm old and bitter uh, would be good examples. <laughs> K-On! I mean, in some ways... Look, a lot of the stuff that uh, Kyoto Animation has made would be considered yeah. moe. Not all of it, but a lot of it. I mean, it's Obviously, not, not, not free, not free, but most of it. Would, well would Lucky Star moment. fall under that? I, I never even considered Lucky Star as, as something... What with it be, being such a beloved by a target audience of women. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, all these all these well, I, I didn't mean to genres are, I mean, they're <laughs> sales genres, basically. Yeah. Yeah. They're marketing. Like, it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean, like, what's it called? Um, Like, Nozaki-kun? That's technically like a um, God, I'm having a huge mind blank right now. Shoujo. Sho no, 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 it's a shonen. Technically. No, seriously, the one about the shoujo Shoujo artist? Yeah, it's in a it's in a shonen magazine. Oh, and so I, like I didn't know. Uh, and so I didn't know at, that a at, all. <laughs> at the end of the day, like this stuff is really fluid and it's just like the crossover, but you have to define it as something. So you do what I would they, point out is they, um they <clears throat> approach it uh I'm sorry, could I, uh they no, no, they no, approach ahead. it as as something for a, a male audience. Um do you think that that was purposeful for the bait and switch of the uh the basically the flip in the what what the uh, story is truly about? Like, was that supposed to a little bit? I mean, here's the thing: when I, because you, when you first hear about Madoka, and especially, I mean, the the poster gets to this, and if you were just seeing like promotional materials, I could see how it would be a bait and switch in terms of oh, cute girls doing cute things, and then it's like oh my god. This is, but the show doesn't really hide that very long. Like, 
really well, the, like two, the weirdness and the creepiness. Yeah. I mean, even then though, like the even the first and second, like there's something a little off kilter about them. Yeah, the tone, the tone of those first two episodes is in line with the rest of the series, that's in a different way. I have yeah, said it's still not all fans of the show feel this way, but I've often said that I like the the show that those first two episodes sort of theoretically promises of like a sort of grounded high school drama about teenage girls that flirts with genre stuff in the background. I would totally watch that version of that show too because I found I mean, it very compelling. Even those first yeah, well, two episodes. I think the first two episodes. That's a lot of that is some of Shaft's bread and butter. I mean, if you've seen a lot of Shaft shows, and I guess I have, so that's valuable here. <laughs> they do a lot of school comedies. Like one of their first big shows was Panty Pony Dash, which was essentially a uh, kind of an Azumanga Dio type school comedy about a 10 year old who's teaching a class that is older than her because she's like a genius, but she's also kind of adorable. And uh, it also had like silly pastiches and random stuff and robots and so on. So, right. so they, they have all these kind of, so the teacher in the, in the first two episodes, the one who's upset about her love life, she could have come out of any of these shows. You know, she, yeah, it's, no, it's a, a similar kind of comedic sense of humor. And that's yeah, it. And it, even the kind of darkness, the weirdness, the kind of strange animation touches. Well, that's literally what I expect. From uh, Shaft. That's yeah. why I watch a Shaft anime. You watch a Shaft anime, you're going to see some weird stuff. Yeah, There's yeah, an I, episode I, of Sayonara Zespo Sensei, which is entirely claymation for no reason other than let's make an episode that's claymation. Oh. They go to some strange, that's awesome. wonderful places. Yeah, that series. is cool. Yeah. Yeah. My experience with the, with the experimental animation style as a person who had never like, yeah, you're you're a huge Shaft fan. I had never seen, I had never really heard or seen of Shaft prior to being introduced to Madoka originally, and like that's that's a big polarizing aspect of the show for a person who has no experience with Shaft. Where I I found it very compelling and as an important extension of the show's general nature, where and some people just find it very alienating. Where yeah, you can say that oh yeah, this is just Shaft's, this that's what Shaft does. Yeah, I mean even then though, like the the they go into the witch universe within the first two episodes, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, even yeah. that like it's a little yeah. more. Uh, that is true. Un- like, it's a little more unsettling than your average. Like yeah. you can tell it's going in yeah. a weird place. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's easy yeah, to but... anyway, show between the first two episodes and when mommy gets decapitated, but uh-huh. but it's not as like linear. Yeah, as to me, like it didn't. That. And I think the thing is too, like as far as That's who's this uh, targeted for, like the. Like, Mo, Moe connected with tragedy. Like, that's been a thing for a while. Well, Cause, I mean, even, yeah. yeah, someone mentioned mm-hmm. Clanad, like, that's a good lead-in in some ways. Like, yes, it yeah. has this Mo visual aesthetic, but the entire, like, kind of latter end of the story is basically, you know, it's built on this tragedy or, uh, you know, a show I like a lot, which is Sorno Roto. You know, that show is, again, like, pretty, slightly less, but, Still pretty, like, kind of cute aesthetic, but there's a lot of, you know, serious war violence going on in the latter half of that show, and that's from 2010, I think. So, I mean, this this thing of taking cute girls doing cute things and turning it into cute girls doing suffering things, like, eh, there's a there's a niche for that. Or in Madoka's <laughs> case, an enormous audience. And yeah, earlier, and the, and earlier you decided an even earlier example, right Elfin Lead. Back, yeah, uh, way back so, in 2004. That's, yeah, that's um, like uh, Elf and Lead, adorable girls, horrible things happen to them, incredible amounts of violence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What I was so, going to point out though is earlier in this episode we pointed out that that this in, this tonal intersection isn't inherently like contradictory t- contradictory to the earlier history of the m- magical girl genre as you guys established with the cases of characters dying in Sailor Moon, you have, I know, I, I know I've read, I, I don't remember the specific titles, but I know I've read of other examples where people have made the arguments of saying, like, Madoka Magica isn't doing, you know, like, people make a big deal out of it, but, about this aspect of it, but it's not completely unique in being a show right. that is part of this genre and is also obscenely dark. Well, I think that well, the big uh, Revolutionary Girl, uh, Utena would be an obvious example. Well, yeah. I yeah, think that the canonical, it is perhaps the canonical dark magical girl show i think that the big difference to me is okay unlike the other magical girl shows anytime somebody is sacrificed it's a big deal you know like they are sacrificing themselves for something bigger in in 
Madoka Magica, girls die. They get de- they get de- decapitated. That's just what happens when you're fighting a battle. You know, it's not it's not like I mean like that's to me the shock wasn't so much that sad things happen. It was more of the body count of the uh yeah, it's like uh, pointless bad things. Pointless, yeah, pointless bad things. The, not pointless the, in terms of narratively pointless. No, 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 but, no, 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 no. But yeah, like yeah. yeah, yeah, not pointless in narratively, but in the idea that like there's a body count, there's a body count behind these powers that yeah, I would I would point that, to that probably coming more from Gen or Ibuchi than anything. Like having seen other of his works, I'm sure everyone else. Oh yeah, did. he loves offing people. That's well, I, I think <laughs> yeah. this is the point where we should point out his fans have called him Uro Butcher. Right, that's his name. <laughs> I mean, even but actually, I'm, uh, talk, I'm talking about more than just the, uh, the the reductive conception of like someone like people perceiving him or or George R. R. Martin, for example, for Western example, as people who they like killing characters. I'm saying more to it than that. I'm saying the specific atmosphere that. Amber's talking about the sort of like that this is a part of life and the quote unquote pointlessness of of what of why they're dying is again or what you think. Yeah. Tell me one thing. Well, I, I would also like to point out though, um, since Martin was brought up, uh, Yoshiyuki Kill 'em All Tamino, the creator of Mobile Suit Gundam, was also very fond of very large death counts and sometimes very shocking, pointless deaths. I always remember the one in Space Runaway Idion's movie. Where a child of about four in a spacesuit has his head just blown clean off. Mm. You know? Oh, it's good. Boom. At the end, you see, at the end of that movie, everyone dies and the universe is reset. So that's another way Madoka is, you know, while right. big, it's, it's not like trailblazing the idea of people breaking the universe. Yeah, but no, no, tragic no. Way. But, but with still, the, the, the conventions the are. are very with the, I, I just find it interesting whenever some, I mean, I know that it's not, it's not groundbreaking, obviously, but, yeah. but it's still, uh, whenever somebody decides to go outside this very conventional mold of, uh, how you treat your characters, how you treat deaths of characters, et cetera, et cetera, uh, like, it's still kind of shocking because that is not, that's really not mainstream, even though this one is yeah. incredibly popular. I mean, what's interesting what I mean? so. is that, uh, that cuts across to Chronicle also, um, you know, it, it's pretty similar in superhero movies. Usually when someone dies, it's like it's in the heat of battle mm. or, you know, making some sacrifice. In Chronicle, the, the Andrew character is, you know, uh, having a tantrum, basically, uh, and, and he flies up during a thunderstorm, and his friend gets hit by lightning and, and dies. That's how he dies. Didn't he cause the lightning? Yeah, well, he yeah, 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 he, he caused the lightning. The one yeah. Yeah. Because, right, uh, but he didn't other kill him says intentionally. There was no yeah. lightning there. It was an Obviously accidental death. It was yeah. an accident, but it was still like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was an accidental yeah. death in the sense yeah. that if you beat someone to death and you only intended to wound them a little bit, it was that yeah, kind exactly. of accident. But exactly. uh, it also was kind of a psycho element, although that's probably more true now than it was in the movie it was made, because Michael B. Jordan is the biggest star in that film. If you know anyone who's in the film, you know Michael B. Jordan. You know, he was in The Wire, he's in Friday Night Lights, he's in Fruitvale Station, he was in Creed, and yes, he was also in Fantastic Four. Compared to the other two people, I had no idea who they were. I later looked up and learned one of them was like the Green Goblin in the new Spider-Man mo- movies, they, but they I would not have known that. Somewhat prominent at this point, that he gets a lot of like very intense emotional dramatic roles. He was in, he had yeah. a major role in Place Beyond the Pines. Yeah, yet he was in a Spider-Man movie, etc. But yeah, Michael, you do not expect far, you do not expect him to die while at this like point. when the movie is like only halfway through. Yeah. If he's gonna yeah. die at all, he's gonna die at the end. I mean, yeah, especially Jordan. when we only have three main characters to start with. Exactly. Yeah. And he was so the it's, more it's really shocking. one of the three main characters yeah. and so on and so forth. Well, even the villain has rather, uh, uh, even Andrew has a rather, uh, what do you call it? Uh, anticlimactic death. <laughs> like, he's literally just like in the middle of a rage. Stab. Spears. Yeah, so yeah. that's probably budget. Yeah. But... Staff. No, yeah, no, but, uh, no, you know, no. Still, though, it's like very. It feels kind of true to the idea of these kids who get. But, but it was like after yeah. a long, big uh, tantrum, big they smashed through a couple oh, of buildings. Yeah. Well, that's you know, another like, thing too. It was a tantrum. There yeah. was no. There was no. Uh, there was no. You know, in other superhero movies, there's always a plan. There's an idea of what they want, and all Andrew is having is a big, like his life sucks tantrum. 
you know, yeah. that well, is something. He's kind of actually, actually that just makes me think something. Yeah, so the okay. arc of Andrew is like the yeah. arc from Magical Girl yeah. to Witch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Andrew is pretty much not like a real one, but sort of like a a, a like the cinematic depiction of like a school shooter. Yeah. Like, superpowers. Yeah. Like yeah. he even wears the uh. Even where it's like the black, all black, and the, the gas mask and, that, and everything. It's got the trench coat yeah, thing going on, yeah. That's kind of yeah. Dane DeHaan's bread and butter as far as the kind of characters he plays. Yeah, the, these these solid oh, characters. Yeah, like and, he, and this, I, I love the little subversion with the gas mask because it's one of the creepiest things anyone does in the movie. And it's also the most superhero thing, I mean, putting on a mask. He's the only yeah. guy to ever put on a mask, and it's like very unnerving that he does it at all. <laughs> Mm. I, 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 the I gas mask, it, honestly, but, but I'm glad that came up. I was boxing at the time, and I, I said, oh, my God, he's become the fireman. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he's become a guy. What's the name of that Team Fortress 2 guy? Pyro. Oh, Pyro. Pyro, yeah. Pyro. Yeah. Pyro. <laughs> oh, my God, that that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> and going into that for a second, um, something I was trying to say a lot earlier in regards to, like, paralleling to what, what you said, William, about mm-hmm. that the Madoka Magica sort of ends where other series might begin with the the climax of, of Madoka's arc is that she ascends, not just but she transforms not just into a magical girl but into God and how that affects everything. Um like the end point of Chronicle after 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 Andrew dies, you have the third one whose name I don't remember because I saw uh, that movie Matt, eight years ago. I think Matt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like yeah. The, the last member of the trio, the only one who's still alive, he's he, yeah, he, he takes his camera out to like the Himalayas and he leaves this message and it's very much like, like, like I said about Chronicle being an origin movie for, with no source material. Like, like that, that ending point is like, that would, that would be the lead off into like a, a superhero franchise. That yeah. would be the starting point. I feel like yeah. it was, uh, I think they were probably homaging both uh mm-hmm. Batman and Superman there. Yeah. Both. I, I mean, it definitely yeah, I was thinking both. Batman because you've got, you know, he you've got the Tibet. Yeah, exactly. But like he's got he's got the Tibet, but he also is in a fortress of 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 cold, you know, like <laughs> literally cold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the big just, like, the end oh, of of get, being alone. Which made me think of <laughs> Superman in terms of he's had an arc that is that builds towards him being sort of like Superman's characterization is proper characterization yeah. and not yeah. how he's characterized in his most I mean, it works as a nice self-contained story. I would be more than happy if they never made a sequel oh. to it. Well, yeah, it works. Yeah. It works oh, well, yeah. acting, but that would be, like, the beginning yeah. of the character's arc in a lot of I'd other be a little dis- I'd be disappointed if they did make a Chronicle 2, because uh, mm. I feel like then they would have to, they would fall in line with all the other super movie, hero movies. They'd, they'd have to they escalate. Have to make things- yeah, and, and they'd have to make a and, they'd yeah, have to yeah. make a villain that was unconnected to the old plot. Yeah, it would be a mess. Yeah, uh, they would probably have to move away from the camera situation, which is a little right. dodgy yep. as is. Oh, yeah. One thing yeah. about the camera, uh, when I was yeah, watching yeah. the movie, there's a couple of shots which clearly cannot be from any of the cameras of the movie, particularly yeah. in the final battle. Yeah. Yeah, one thing me, I do like yeah. is is um like obviously found footage, not a new idea. Yeah, but because it's a superhero film. As they go on, they use the fact of the superpowers to let the found footage become more cinematic, to allow the camera to position itself at a place where it wouldn't be able to d- do if it yeah. was, you know, right. yeah, that was if they clever. were just found footage. The I like that I the element of the style. Like, telekinetically carrying it around, and it's very yeah. swooping as the movie goes along. Yeah. And, I mean, that. I feel like that very much takes away from, like, the strengths of what, what the found footage style, like... I, 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 you see, no, I, I, I like that. Well, what I just like coolness, is when they cut away from it. I liked yeah, it when me. he was when he drags away all of the devices from everybody who's in the um space yeah. needle and just has them flying around him so that they can get a quote unquote cinematic shot, you know, right. while I still really, making it. Like, I felt there was well, a, I didn't like that bit because you know format. Like it, that felt like a weak justification. I yeah. I know I, well I knew what they were doing at the time, but at the same time I was like, All right, I'll give you this. I, I thought it was a mildly <laughs> you, you clever you way a, to deal with a, the, around it. <laughs> the one very effective, the one very effective use of the of the uh, of the conceit is this is the bit of it's it's part of the whole supervillain escalation is that he's in the junkyard and he's monologuing to the camera as he's like 
telekinetically crushing a car. Like that to me is like the best use of the the fact. Yeah, that's no, it's, it's the I, I would I would say the best use is when they're flying. You know, the first time they fly, because you know I've seen obviously a lot of superhero movies where people go up and fly. Well, this is the first one which really felt real. Like they're up there, it's cold, it's wet. There are planes that could fucking kill you. And if you fall, it's a long way down. You can really feel the tension of the idea of flying. I think the fact that the camera is, is, you know, part of the scenery and, you know, sometimes goes completely out of control helps solidify the fiction of this real flying people thing. Okay, so, um, I, I thought, okay, I thought that they... I thought that was a great sequence. Yeah, I didn't actually, um, I didn't actually read Chronicle as a superhero movie. I was actually watching it as a horror movie because... I mean, if you look at it, I mean, found footage that uh, use a lot of horror movies. It's basically the arc of Carrie, where this um, troubled outcast teenager gets, uh, has them psychic powers and starts and goes a rampage. And it's not, they're not really superheroes. They're not fighting bad guys and, or doing anything. They're just messing around and then they, they start killing each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does, I, I heard that the original draft, all three of them become psychopathic. So that's a good point. Oh, interesting. I feel like it, it. I feel like it became a superhero movie just in the sense it has all the broad beats. That's what I mean. Yeah. Like not not. There's only one of them that could really be considered a hero, but yeah. you know, superhero movies don't need more than one hero. Really. And you know, the only thing that he was Sorry, heroic Civil War. about. Well, I think that the only thing he was really heroic about even was was stopping his cousin. You know, yeah. like, and, and because nothing else he did, I mean, he, and he literally seemed to do that mostly out of obligation and love towards his cousin, but it was too late. You know what I mean? Like, right. Again, I would point to the ending where he's like, like his characterization is leaning towards a more straightforward, broader, I will save people superhero mindset. Well, he said, I admit, I said, saw this movie like three years the, ago, yeah. but it's the way I remember it. Uh, I saw it just this afternoon and he did have a thing when he was talking to Andrew on the camera in Tibet and said yeah. that he was really thinking about it and how he was going to find out how they got the powers and also try to be good with it, like do good. Yeah. like that. That's really thing. Matt's entire arc because he's constantly yeah. talking about philosophy. I mean constantly to the point it was like, oh my God, was I like this when I was 17? <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah, have you read Arthur Schopenhauer? <laughs> Yeah, but um, th- there's also a specific point where he begins to think later that he misses his old, more naive conception of morality as good versus evil rather than, you know, Schopenhauerian will conquering all. So this this kind of shift in him towards valuing that moral system. He's the only character who really has an inclination towards a strong moral code, and it keeps coming up. Like when, um, what's his name, the bad one smashes a car early in the movie and almost kills a guy. Matt's the one who goes in and saves him. And after he says, we have to have rules. You know, he's already thinking about ethical applications of the power. He's the first person to suggest it. And he's the first person to try and formulate it. So I think all through the movie, there are these elements of him where you can see, well, yeah, this guy is going to become a hero in retrospect. It wasn't exactly ethical applications of the ethical limitation. Don't kill. Yeah. I mean, it's not like he's like a wonderful, amazing guy. It's just like, Oh, here's these little elements that well, you recognize yeah. in heroes. And, and with with Andrew too, it had the opposite. That scene where uh, he crushes the car, I felt was incredibly unnecessary because they all already had two really good scenes uh, to show that he was on the path, you know. And one was when hmm. he breaks apart the spider into its like different little components, and the other was when he pulls the teeth out of that kid's mouth, you know. But it's not so much the pulling the teeth; it's when he was describing the skill with which he pulled them out. Like, the one one he could get really well, but the other two broke, and then he says, oh, God, it was just sloppy. It was sloppy work. That's fair. You know? I, I can see with, with all of them piling on top of each other, it, it gets a little redundant, but I found that that was the one that was most, like, actually effectively executed, at least personally. I didn't care as much about a lot of what was happening in the movie, from what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I rather liked it. I, I admit to uh, crying I at the end of it, okay. and I also cried at the end of Madoka because I'm a crier. Oh, I so. can't cry. <laughs> I said, I, I, I didn't hear. I have I don't no heart. Like I, I, I rarely <laughs> cry, no but the part that gets me in Madoka is the Hamura arc. Oh. When you uh, see how yeah. far she's gone, 
God. how long she's come, how she went from that timid little girl to that hardened, practical, gun-toting, magical Baby girl. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the time travel. And incidentally, the gun-toting the itself is a little subversive. Like, just to digress to uh, Black Lagoon for a moment. Black Lagoon, uh, at one point, did these little joke things at the end of some episodes. And one of them was, what if Revy was a magical girl? And she's like, I'm a magical girl. I use guns. And that, that's the whole joke. Because the inherent idea of a magical girl with guns is funny because it's so ridiculously dark. But with Homura, guns, grenades, so, yeah. rocket launchers. Mm-hmm. She uses conventional weaponry right across the board. And it's a way okay. that she's very different but also a way that's visually quite interesting. And her arc is, includes, like, part of it is like, the escalation of the kind of weaponry that she's using mm. and how she's using yeah. it. Um, but yeah, no, the, the Homura time travel character arc episode is like an all-timer to me. <laughs> that's God. That's the moment where the yeah. series, for me, went from being very good to one of the best shows of this decade. Oh, God, that's that whole episode. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's one of the better. I think I, I would put it in the top. 10 of episodes of anime in general, just her entire, that, that entire arc of, uh, who she became. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying about being an old timer. Like, mm-hmm. they, I, they, also, I also feel like the subs undermine it a little bit. What? Um, an issue oh, I had with the subtitles. Really? Yeah. Because, um, okay. An understandable thing with subtitles is if characters address each other, you have them address them by their given name because that's more common in English. But the characters in Madoka mostly refer to each other by their surnames. Right. Now, I understand generally having given names, but something the series makes a huge deal about is that Madoka is the one that calls her Hamura. Yeah. She's a Kemi to everyone else. And conversely, oh, yeah. Hamura right. always right. refers to Madoka as Madoka, you know, while she's Konami to a lot of other people. And that's revealed over the course of the time travel arc that firstly, the fact that Madoka calls her Hamura and likes her name is a way that they connect to each other. And she never calls her Madoka until Madoka is dying, and as she dies, she says, I like that you said that. And then every other time, throughout time, she always calls her Madoka. Oh, that's just a, such a sweet element of the character that I feel like the subtitles obscure a little bit. That's mm-hmm. my little subtitle rant. That's I generally am fine with subtitles. I have absolutely no understanding of Japanese, so I'm sure other people will feel I'm completely wrong about this, but that's just my two cents. Is, is there an English dub? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, there is. I didn't watch, watch the dub very much. I've been very anti the dub, but but Dur- William makes a completely fair point. And Homura and Madoka's relationship. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being a teenager again. Yeah, dub was <laughs> dub's usually on that. And it's great because you know when you meet Homura, she's very cold. Mm. But then you realize her always calling her Madoka. That's you know that means something. And we know why. We eventually know why she's so cold. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know this whole thing about the lone crusader carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. So yeah. When when I see that, when it get when it gets a bit too much, it just makes me realize how artificial and constructed it is. Like how magical girls that exist. So the reason these girls are suffering is because the writers are like. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's making me realize just how precisely they constructed the world and their characters to make them that way. Maximal. Just writers maximal in general? Because... Yeah, writers in general, but I, I would mean, say that that's just it gets into general, arguments man. about what <laughs> the subtext uh, and sort of allegory of the series is about, about what they're, I don't, I don't want to get too much into this, but yeah. Gotta, well, gotta I think, bring out those suffering points, man. <laughs> well, I think one thing that connects both Chronicle and Madoka is obviously they're fantasy films, but the emotions can be grounded in like real problems for a lot of the characters. Yeah. Like Sayaka, who we haven't talked about her much. You know, her problem <laughs> is that her uh, childhood friend and boy she's obviously his feelings for has uh, broken his hand and is never able to play music again. He was a gifted prodigy. And this is tearing her up, you know, having to care for someone who's suffering so much because who the, their self-image of themselves has been ripped apart. And, of course, alternately in Chronicle, our cameraman is dealing with an abusive father. And, in fact, that's why he has the camera to begin with. So they take these real emotions and then they supersize them through the fantasy, which in itself is kind of a, an allegory for the intensity of teenage emotion. Like, that's explicitly in Madoka. 
you know, the reason Cube preys in teenagers is, and specifically teenage girls, is because their emotion is the best from his okay. completely awful perspective. Well, I would like to point out that Radica, the characters are a lot younger than uh, Radica. And you'll find that in a lot of like, Japanese series, like Pokerado, that for some reason it's always the young kid who basically on the cusp of puberty and suddenly being thrust into the world world versus the typical superhero who's more like Spider-Man. My, uh, my understanding of it is that because the way the Japanese education uh, the, the around 13 or so, the kids decide which education path they go. Like, um, so basically, you're deciding your life when you're around 13. Years. Well, well actually, that that actually kind of makes sense then, because it's yeah. it uh, the the way that a lot of superheroes begin really near the end of high school, when in the United States, at least, uh, you are seen as being on the cusp of discovering the rest of life. You know, so. Yeah, it's sort of a cultural uh, matter of where exactly the, the like the line between adolescence and for and the beginning of adulthood is. Yeah, I think it's also a practical one. Um, if you're in animation, it's pretty easy to have a car- series about a bunch of twelve-year-olds because you do not need to hire twelve-year-olds to play the parts. Uh, right? Like yeah. it's easier it's easier yeah. to find um, American animated series with twelve-year-old heroes. For example, Avatar: The Last Airbender. Yeah. So I mean, to do a film like Chronicle, and actors who would also be able to look like they're twelve is a very daunting proposition. Right. For most productions. <laughs> well, I think it would just be unsellable no, to no, like an animation. So I also just not look like uh, they were seventeen yeah. to me. I mean, frankly, they were yeah. all at least like twenty-eight to thirty. <laughs> right. That's <laughs> standard Hollywood <laughs> stuff. <though. laughs> I know. I know. Like, Michael B. Jordan is like one year younger than me. So yeah, yeah, he's not he's I not a teenager. Two thousand two Michael Fire. <laughs> which was well, it's, it links into the fantasy part too. No one like film audiences like I don't think they can connect necessarily to like a middle schooler. You know what I mean? Like it's too especially if the movie has like a a, a fantasy component. I don't mean like fantasy as in like elves and shit. Like there needs Man. to be they need to be just old enough where you can be like, oh yeah, that can be me. I think, for general oh, yeah, audience. It is kind of rare that uh, a, a person of middle school age here in the States becomes the protagonist of... Yeah, unless it's like, like very of, of explicitly a coming-of-age story. A child story, you know what yeah. I mean? You know? Yeah, right, yeah. yeah we have a- I mean, like, the one thing that comes to mind is Harry Potter. But then yeah. if you look at all of the things that Harry Potter inspired... They almost always have teenage protagonists, mm-hmm. like the ones that went made to movie. I mean, yeah, Harry Potter starts when he's eleven, but very few of those. Yeah, very few of those. Like Twilight, teenagers, Hunger Games, teenagers, mm-hmm. etc. Yeah. yeah. Although, I, well, no, but she was not the main person. Never mind. And I, I yeah, I think I, I think I would point out is, I mean, relative to like, I, I'll admit I do have the most experience with a lot of the series where there tends to be younger protagonists and Shonen and Mecha mm-hmm. and whatnot, but. But like the the characters in Madoka, they look or they and the art sort of are in a lot of cases makes this makes age ambiguous. Going back to Gunkutsuo, we all find out that uh, the owl bear is actually only 15 years old when we all find. Oh yeah. Him. Yeah, I mean it's all fluid and animated. Like, yeah, great. like all the Madoka characters are all supposed to be 14, 15 primarily. What? Like, yeah. I thought they were like 12, 13. Yeah. Dang. 13 to 15, but primarily 14 and 15. See, this feels like, okay, because when I watched Sailor Moon long, long ago, I didn't realize that they were supposed to be like 13 years old. I thought they were also like, yeah, they are. And I thought that they were all like 17, 16, 17, but no, yeah. they're all 13. You know? I mean, that's, that's the thing with animation. Like, it's just, you just throw ages at a board and just don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah, the they're, art, not, they're not I mean, any age. They're drawn. <laughs> Another good example. I don't want to keep up bringing Lucky Star because I never even saw it, but the characters yeah. in that are 17. What? They look like they're 10. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's just. Yeah, like, their, like their, their art style is very childish and exaggerated. Anyway. Which makes it weird that they get off, choose Get off the age for a second. That yeah, get, um, get off that. Yeah. I think, I think it's sort of interesting right. with this whole show. Because, I mean, Madoka gets talked about so much, it's like, ah, changing the world of magical girls. And what's weird to me, a little bit, Especially as far as this art style is concerned, it feels like there's actually not that much familiarity in 
in the Western, like, anime community of, like, actual magical girl shows. Like, obviously, there's some huge exceptions. Sailor Moon is the really big one. There's, Sailor like, Moon and Card, Card Captor Sakura, to a lesser yeah, degree. Yeah, Card Captor Sakura is the other big one. But, like, oh. well, um, kind of, like, bread and butter magical girl shows that maybe the sort of reversal elements in this would actually sort of apply to. Like, those aren't really the sort of shows that people over here watch. You know what I mean? Uh, like, people don't I have, watch... I have a question. I have a question well, for... I, I, I wrote... okay, for you guys, actually. For, like, anybody who follows uh, more current anime, um, have more magical girl shows been transported and translated and opened up to the Western audience because of um, Madoka Magica as of late? I don't know. I, I, I don't they're, follow. I mean, they're I there. They, you know, that. they... They get subbed and stuff, but they're not huge. And especially, mm-hmm. like, like I said, like, a lot of the, like, really bread and butter magical girl shows are actually targeted towards, like, you know, really, like, little girls. And, cause when you look at some of the most watched anime, a lot of the time, yeah, as far as Japan is concerned, it's stuff that, like, no one here watches. And myself included. Like, uh, some of the really popular anime. And that, that, this genre sort of fits into that. Like, there's really, the sort of daily, like, early morning anime and stuff like that that, that a lot of people in Japan watch that's really popular is really not, you know, it's it's not big here. It's not what people... Well, can... there's, one good, there's one good example of that, because um, over the past couple of years, Netflix has gained the exclusive license to a number of anime titles, uh, like Knights of Sidonia, Asian, Demi-Human. Uh, there's another series this season whose name I forget, and you may have seen one or two of these. But I'd be willing to bet money no one here has watched one Netflix original anime called Glitter Force, which is I their did, English... I did remember Glitter seeing Force, yeah. that. I didn't watch it, but I did remember noticing yeah. that. That is a show aimed at girls, and they changed the name from its original Japanese name. And I think it's only available in the English dub. Or if it's not only available, I think they might have changed some things. Anyway, mm-hmm. I heard people complaining, basically, because there are some people who watch shows like this. There's also uh, another issue with magical girl shows i'm going to paraphrase uh justin savakas here the one of the editors at anime news network is that there was a time these shows were a lot bigger that for most people coming into anime fandom say in the early 90s uh they would have a magical girl show like of the shows that introduced them of the stuff they're watching one of these is a magical girl program but the popularity of the genre which is big in the 90s kind of cratered in the zeros Mm. it's kind of hard to name any Magical girl shows from that period. I mean, yeah, okay. Princess Tutu, uh, Nanoha, uh, oh, other Nanoha, shows. But they were much, but the genre was very much in an ebb throughout that decade. Which, um, anyway, that's what he said. And my understanding is it's in a somewhat better position after Madoka, although that is in part because of Madoka clones. Because, of course, if something's popular, you hit yourself to that ride. Yeah. Mm. That all makes sense to me. I, I could have this wrong. I'm paraphrasing one guy. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I read like five years ago, so grain of salt. Because, you know, there are some traditional magical girl shows, and then there's the subgenre of, of cute girls doing suffering things, uh, which is sort of the Medica clone element. And, but yeah, it's, it's always interesting to me when, when there's, because I think what makes this show work ultimately is it's just, it's just a well-made show. The characters are great. The story is well-constructed. You know, when you get too tied up in, oh, it's doing these really interesting things with this genre, to a certain extent, it's kind of like, you know, what's what's where's the familiarity with that genre actually coming from versus just, yeah, yeah. the character designs are maybe a little, you know, unexpected versus the content. But ultimately, it's just because the thing works. Like, it's just well-made. I mean, people talk about uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion tearing apart the conventions of the mecha genre, but for many fans, it would be the, one of the first mecha they've ever seen. It was certainly one of mine. Yeah. You know, and it's also dealing with very specific elements of the genre, which are mostly unfamiliar to Western viewers. I mean, it's basically about importing the traditions of 70s pre-Gundam mecha into the more dominant post-Gundam style. Which is, is meaningless if you don't know what that is. Right. Yeah, I have no idea what I've I've literally of all the anime I've never watched, uh, Mecca would be up the top. 
Like, and I've you never all know how I that. feel about Mecca already. <laughs> I, I like it, but I, I wouldn't call myself the biggest expert here by any means. Well, I only watched a bunch of them when I was a kid. It was like the, the classic one. Like, uh, Gigantor? No, not that one. Uh, what the hell was that one? Voltron? The Zinger Z. Yeah, no, actually, kind of, yes, Voltron. I was thinking of him as Zinger Z. Did anyone watch Gigantor? I... I I'm the one person who watched Gigantor, haven't I? I literally only know Voltron from cultural osmosis. Thanks. Yeah, me too. I, I don't think Voltron yeah. ever aired here. Mm. You know, there's an element to which, you know, which series are more popular varies a lot. I mean, for example, in France, Captain Harlock would be a much bigger deal than Voltron, because Voltron's really an American thing. Mm. Anyone remember Thunderbirds? <laughs> yes. Yes. Was that yes, the puppets one? Wait, no, it's the puppets. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had my own um, Thunderbird <sighs> plane thingy, couple of those. Okay painting them. I think really that's the point of the show. You look at it and you're like, I want to assemble planes and put little stickers on them. <laughs> I mean, that that's Jerry Anderson's entire ethos. I mean, digressing a bit, but his shows are all about how awesome it's to put stickers on little machines. Well, yeah. the whole um, cartoon <laughs> show, like that's basically the reason for all the old cartoon shows, right? Like, do make it by boys. Right. Merchandising. Oh, yes. Which yes. doesn't happen today at all, I mean. No. <laughs> ah. And anyway. merchandise is a huge part to kind of save this entire segment. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because people buy, you know, models of all the girls mm-hmm. in their costumes. Right. You know, honestly, if someone told me right now that there are people out there who have, like, statues of Hitomi as a magical girl, I would believe it. And if you don't remember, Hitomi is the friend of Sayaka who, uh, Gets her uh, childhood friend as a boyfriend. She never becomes a magical girl, but I bet somewhere there's a toy of what if she became a magical girl? Because that's the kind of market you're selling to. Yep. Uh, also, sure there's is. a shit ton of Madoka video games, which are actually fascinating to read about if you're a big enough fan. Like what kind of video sure. game? Dozens of guys. Yeah. Like, anyway, is it a fighting game or something? Um, they're usual visual. They're usually visual novel. Uh, no. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, Gen or Ibuchi, you know, right. started right. out with visual favorites. novels. Right, right. Claim your way to with visual novels. Anyway, do we any of us have uh, substantive additions? Or we, uh, I, we... I do. I, I had this one thing I wanted to say about Mami Tomoe's death. You know, I mean, the way it specifically goes against expectations is what does she do before she dies? She says, Kiro finale! And she gets out her, you know, weapon and she does her finishing move. So it's not just that she dies. She dies after she's done her finishing move. When she does her finishing move, the battle should be over. That's the logic, uh, the cartoon logic of a magical girl show or really of any kind of action anime to certain extents. And what's very revealing about her as a character is that when her finishing move doesn't work, she does nothing. She just stands there and gets eaten. Moments later, we see the same thing try to eat Homura, and she jumps out of the way. So it's not like she was paralyzed. It's not like she was unable to move is that she's so astonished that it didn't work, she's frozen in place. I think that says a lot about her as a character. She's working from a script, and when the script fails her, she has nothing. You know, uh, Homer later describes her as someone who uh, acted stronger than she was, and I think that's really what that moment's about. She has one move, yeah. which is time. Like, her magical girl yeah. power yeah, her isn't something is she can use in fight. Something. So Yeah, it's yeah. not something direct, quote-unquote. Yeah, but she didn't announce her attacks. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's because Homura is, at this point, the very cold pragmatist and is not, again, not engaging with certain, like, yeah, traditional At animals. this point, yeah, she's she's Indiana Jones shooting at the swords guy. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like Buccarano, actually, because, like, the first kid, the plucky kid who's obviously the lead, who also dies in the first episode, yeah. he's like, can I name my punches? No, and, and that is gone by the end of the show very quickly. Okay, so actually, just one quick question with Bukurano. Um, I only read the manga, not watched the anime. And the manga got really way the hell depressing. So, did it end? How did it end? Like, um, it basically, they won and they, um, and they just kept exterminating other universes, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, that's depressing. Pretty much. It's a dark <laughs> ending. Although, the interesting thing about the anime is that the guy who made the anime hated the manga. And he said as much. So I think there's some differences. I've not read the manga, so I don't know where the differences are. But yeah. I, haven't, I haven't yet checked Bukurano out, uh, out in any respect. Um, it was recommended to me by the same person who introduced me to Madoka. Well, yeah. the guy who made the manga, 
he has this weird obsession about putting kids through a wall. I think that's, by this point, we must assume that's a requirement for writing in this business. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <Yeah. laughs> it gets really out there. Like, um, there was this one, um, this one other series, I forget what the hell it was, it was Rising Star or something? Something Star. And, um, you think it starts off like a normal kid's adventure. By the end of it, like, the world is oh, dead. Oh, God. What? I know that one. Yeah. I think I know that one. Yeah, yeah, like, every, everyone's dead. There's only two people left alive, and, like, uh, there's, like, rape and incest and something. Oh, 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 uh, uh, where we, where, where we are, or, that was then. Oh, now and then, then, here and that there. Was, now yeah, and yeah, there we go. Yeah, 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 yeah. There I we go. Heard that. Oh, that's, that's, that is that's... so depressing, and it's also completely wonderful. That's it's a, really, an excellent, really good. terrible, the emotional series. Okay, it's like really, really good in the sense that you watch it once and you kind of never watch it again. Never watch it again. Yeah, <laughs> and you don't want to. And I highly recommend that nobody suggests we do it for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I want to talk about a child soldier who's named Boo. <laughs> Come on. Oh. Well, don't make me get on a plane and stab you. You already like. <laughs> okay, okay, we, we won't do it. We're getting, okay. we're getting back into uh, Golgo Thirteen territory, guys. <laughs> okay, okay, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> uh, we love you, William. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any final thoughts besides that one? Uh, we all recommend both of these, uh, both of these pictures. Yes. Slash TV shows. I would say yes. Quite, yes. Medica is pretty great. Chronicle is above average. It's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that entirely. I would agree with that. As, yeah, indeed. It was a good, a good watch. Uh, both of them. Uh, well, the thing I, I would say about Chronicle that I think is to its credit, it's short. It's an hour and thirty minutes. Yeah. Which I think is a length yeah. that more superhero films should aim for. <laughs> yes. That'd be great. Two and a half hours. I gotta get my bang for my dollar. Three hours of things smashing each other. Oh God! Is that how long Civil War is? is Civil is War is half hours. Yeah. 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 You see the Batman yeah. and the Wonder Woman smash the giant monster in the city, and a building exploded. Oh my God! <laughs> Eighteen dollars worth. See, I knew it sucked, so I decided to wait until it came out on DVD. Oh I, yeah, I have yeah. uh, no see, way to see it. But, was, uh, was, on the other see. hand. Civil War tonight, but now I'm like, maybe I'll see the Jungle Book instead. <laughs> um, if you like oh, yeah. superhero movies, it's it's there. It gets you there. It gets, uh, I feel it gets like me where I, I should say. <laughs> I feel I should say something about Rebellion. Like, oh. there's not a lot to talk about, but the short version is, um, Homura becomes Satan so that she can cut off a part of Madoka to be with her. It works out. I mean, it's not that she's that um, evil. She just becomes an embodiment of evil because that's what she has to be to counter the laws of the universe to get herself a version of Medica and also to not die. So I think it's kind like, of interesting that it kind of embraces Hamra as a kind of villain, but in a way that's very sympathetic and doesn't hurt people. Yeah. It, it, okay, that admittedly doesn't make a whole lot of sense out of context, but the film spends a lot of time laying the groundwork for that. It's like a two-hour movie. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. I spoiled it for everyone, but I felt I should say something. Okay. And um, just one one thing, like um, the um, the other series I was talking about, I just looked it up. It's called Shadow, sorry, Shadow Star. And yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Shadow Star wasn't very good, as as I recall. I mean, it was like just kind of dark and edgy, and that was kind of it. I think wasn't there like a what was it this what was the kind of fish starfish? Yeah. Some sort of evil yeah. starfish or something, yeah. Evil starfish? Yeah. yeah. Don't you hate evil starfish? <laughs> I don't know. Ah, Shadow. they're the I worst. Know. I know oh, the. Yeah. I think it was Gyo, oh, zombie sharks. I know there's the one with the evil plants. I have not heard yeah. of evil starfish. Look, Shadow Star is the perfect show for if you've seen every single, everyone's so innocent, and then they're not anime. Uh, and you need one more. But other than that, there's not <laughs> a lot to recommend it. I, 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 I just need I just need one more to cut, like hold me over just the one the one. That well, I, I just realized that <laughs> I've seen enough for this to be valid because I'd completely yeah. forgotten about Shadow Star. But then I realized, oh my god, I've seen so many of these kind of anime that they just blur out of my mind. Yeah, not not all of them can be Madoka or I'm not a fan of Ava, but obviously a lot of people love Ava for valid reasons. 
I love Ava, for the record, everyone. William is a huge Evangelion fan. My first podcast, I called Gendo Akari a genocidal romantic, and I think that's the smartest <laughs> thing I ever said in a podcast. I still have not seen it. I also have not <laughs> seen it, because I, I just kind of, I don't know, actively avoid any kind of mecha uh, anime in general, which I know is probably... You know, a sin. But... Ava is culturally important enough that you should check it oh, out. Oh, that's what well, you said forget, about forget, for, forget, forget culturally important. <laughs> it's just really emotionally devastating and twisted. No, it's not. And yes, it is. <laughs> I <laughs> fell for Shinji. <laughs> I fell for Shinji. It's, and Asuka. It's probably, a, it's probably good that we only have two people who have seen Ava and they're just like completely opposite sides of it. See, I think I would like I would keep nitpicking the theology, and, which would probably drive me insane. I, I mean, well, the best way to approach that is okay. to say it's you like it because it looks cool, and that's yeah, that's yeah. really the start and end of it. About the characters, every, don't worry about the. Look, there, there's a lot know, of stuff that means stuff in, Ev- in Evangelion, but the Christian stuff is there because it's exotic. It's like if you see Doctor Strange and mm-hmm. has all this Buddha stuff mm-hmm. flowing around, but they don't care anything about Buddhism. They just wanted to put some weird shit in there with trailer, you know. That's kind of Evangelion's attitude towards Christianity. But the interesting thing about it is they get to really obscure stuff. You know, they have like, they use Gnostic gospels. They have like Lilith, you know, the oh. other person in the Garden of Eden and that kind of stuff. So there's no like really boring biblical references. They dig deep to get some really fun stuff. I like Evangelion. <laughs> okay, so that's it for this podcast. And next time we are watching the Rose of Versailles, an anime about the French Revolution. And since we're doing the French Revolution, we are comparing it to the movie Marie Antoinette. Thanks for listening. See you next time.